Hey guys, this is Mitch with Fine Point CGI, and today we're going to talk about how to integrate Steam into Godot using the Face Punch Steamworks add on. Now, this is for C, -sharp, not for GD script, because the Face Punch Steamwork add on is only for C. -sharp. But we're going to go through the process of setting up our Steamworks integration. We're going to talk about some of the requirements that you have to have, which is you have to pay Steam $100 to even use the Steamworks add-on in general. And we're going to talk about how to get your list of friends, how to get achievements and set achievements, how to create a leaderboard. And finally, we're going to talk about cloud saving and how important that is. And in the next video, we will be talking about how to use the Steam backbone for doing networking, because that's going to be almost a video in itself with the amount of information we're going to have to talk about. So that's what I have in store for you guys today. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the first thing that we have to talk about is some of the requirements we're going to need before we can do this tutorial. So first, you need to have a Steamworks account and you have to go through their sign up process. Now, I already have a Steamworks account, but for you to go through their sign up process, you need to go in, sign up, connect your Steam account to your Steamworks account, and you need to pay them a hundred dollars to get access to their server system. So that's going to be a major prerequisite to this tutorial. And you're going to need to create a application here. So you actually get access to Steamworks. Once you have those things settled, then you're good to go from this point forward. And normally I would show you guys how to run through that whole process. But I already had this Steamworks account built way back in the day, back when I worked in the industry. And I already have an unreleased app here. And I just changed the name to Steamwork Tutorial. That way we had some kind of name. And unfortunately, Steam doesn't allow me just to remove a previously created app. And for me to start completely over, it would require me to spend an additional hundred dollars on another Steamworks app. So just make sure that you pay the Steamwork fee, make sure that you run through and create an unreleased application. And then from that point, we can actually pick up and start building our Steam integration. And now that we have a Steamwork app and you are at this page, or if you are at this page right here, you will be ready to do this tutorial. So first, we're going to download the add-on that we need to be able to build this out. Now, I've forked the Face Punch Steamworks to make it work with Godot. Now, there's really not that many changes here for us. It's really just some small stuff that I did. It's, it's more about how I built the project than how um, the code actually is structured. So... As long as we have this all settled, we should be good to go. And I can show you how you guys can do this without making it into too big of a problem for you. And we can cover that in a minute. Now you will notice that I have a release right here that we can use for our project. So if we click on that, you'll see I only have the Windows 64.dll currently, but we can definitely set it up so we can have multiple DLLs here like Linux and Mac. And I will need to get a Mac and I will need to figure out how to build it for those platforms. So once I get through that, they'll probably be here by time this tutorial releases. But right now I just have the Win64 edition. So I'm going to pull down all three of these guys and put them in the root of our project. So let's pull these guys down. And we'll click save and we'll do the same thing for the next one. Click save and the last one. All right. Now that we have our face punch Steamworks, our Steam API and our Steam API 64 bit, let's just grab these guys. Let's open up our Godot project here and let's just drag these guys into the base of our project. Now, if we want this under a folder, we can definitely do that. And I will do that. So I'll right click open in project manager. I will right click, add in a folder here, and I'm just going to call it DLL, and I will 
bring these guys into there just like that. And there we go. Now you don't have to do this if you don't want to, but in my case, I figured it would just be easier for organization purposes. So now that we have this first, we need to create a script to create our solution and all of that. So let's open up a 2D scene. Let's right click it and attach a script. And let's just call it Steam Manager. And let's make that a C Sharp script. And instead of doing RES Steam Manager, let's create a new folder here. And let's just call it Steam and hit OK. Because our entire networking system is going to be quite complicated by the time we're done with this. So we're gonna to need to make sure that this is all really organized. So we'll click Open and we will click create and that will create a steam manager.cs now we'll probably need to make some adjustments to this but that will at least do it for us now for this all to work you have to have a lot of things and there's a lot of working parts in this project now first we need to make sure that we are the owner of our steamworks project okay which in my case i am you can see up here well you can only see my picture because i'm blurring out the rest because it has personal details but you can see that i have my picture that's the same account that i am logged in on with my steam you can see fine point cgi right here you can see the little icon so it's the exact same login okay and that's extremely important because this does not work if you are not registered with your Steam account on here, if you want to test this with other people, you will need to add them to your testers, okay? And I can show you guys that later, but that's just something to keep in mind. And you need to make sure that you are logged into Steam and that you can bring it up just like this or else it will not work, okay? So now that I've covered this and hopefully thorough, um, let's head back to Godot. And let's open up our Steam Manager here. Now, this is going to be where we're going to do all of our Steam stuff, okay? It's going to be basically like the overarching big old Steam controller here. So first, we need to make a static reference to our object. And in my case, I'm going to say public static Steam Manager Manager. And I'm going to make that a prop. So I'm going to say... Quote, get, comma, set, semicolon, and I should probably have done a semicolon, not a comma. I don't know what I was thinking. And you'll see that it just says, hey, you have a class C manager, and that's great, right? So next, we need to get our app ID. So we'll say private static uint, because it is a uintager, game app ID just like that and we'll pass a get comma set just like that and i'm going to default that to my game id so if i head over to my steamworks and you take a look you will see you have a number right here 2145350 and your guys's number is going to be completely different do not use my number if you use my number, you will get a fail to log into the Steam app. And the reason why is because you are not on my testers page. You are not part of my testing team. So therefore you are not allowed to access this. So I'm gonna grab this and I'm going to paste it right just like that. Now, next we need to log our user in. And here's where things are going to get interesting okay first we don't want to do it on ready because we have a lot of stuff in our code that will happen on ready just in general and we want to make sure that we're logged into our steam instance before the rest of the engine is initialized so what we'll do is we'll use a constructor so we'll say public steam manager and then we are going to go ahead and log ourselves in so first we'll say if manager is equal to null, then we will set our manager equal to this. And then we will actually log ourselves in. So we need to put a try catch around this. So try, and we will say 
Steam client dot, and you will notice that we're not getting any auto completion. And the reason why is even though we have a DLL here, that doesn't mean that we're importing that library. We can't just say using Steam works because it doesn't exist. We need to actually tell our CS proj that this DLL exists. So how can we do that? Well, we can do it in a lot of ways. And my personal favorite is using Visual Studio to do it, where I just add a dependency and I call it a day, right? But since most of you probably aren't using Visual Studio, let's actually do this the manual way. So that way we can get a nice, you know, good feeling on how this works. So if we head over to our CS proj, you will see that we have a property group right here. If we come down here and we add in a brackets and we say item group and we close off our item group just like that. And what this is doing is it's creating what's called an item group. And an item group is basically the way that uh, C Sharp knows where items are located. So for instance, an item group could be a DLL. It could be a package reference. It could be a project reference, things like that. Now, usually you separate your package references and your DLL references in different item groups as well. So that's something to keep in mind. So now we need to add a reference. So we'll say bracket reference. And we're going to include is equal to, and we got to pass it the path of where our name of the actual uh, package. In our case, it's called face punch dot steamworks dot win 64, just like that. And we'll close our little bracket. And now we need to tell it where our path is. So we'll say hint path and we got to tell it where it is. So in our case, it is dot slash DLL slash face punch dot steam works dot win 64 dot DLL. We need to close off our hint path just like that. And then we need to close off our reference just like that. And that should hopefully do it. So if we come back here and we say using Steamworks and see if this actually will build for us. So I'm going to comment this out real quick and I'm still not getting a reference, but let's see if I build my project. Is it going to build? If not, then we've got a problem. So it looks like we have a problem. It's still not seeing it. So this is not a valid path. And it looks like I actually have to do steam works, not steam works. And now you can see that it's green, which means that we've successfully imported our plugin. So that's perfect, right? So as long as we have this set up like this and we come over here and we have a green steam works, we should be good to go. Let's see if that will grab our steam client. So we'll say steam works dot, and you should see all sorts of steam related things. And that's perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. So now what we can do is we can actually initialize our steam works. So we'll say steam client dot init, and that's going to initialize our Steam client. Now we need to pass in a game ID. Now we could just pass in this value here, but I want to make this extendable for you guys because frankly, you guys can just download my code and then just kind of steal it and use it for what you want. I don't really have a problem, but I'm going to go through and build this with you guys so you guys can see how that works. So we'll say game app ID comma true. And that will basically allow us to have async callbacks. So that way I don't have to wait for it to return and, and block my thread. Now, what we'll do is we need to determine if our steam client is valid, because if it's not valid, then that means we have an exception and something's broken. So we have to say, if not steam client dot valid is valid, then we can go ahead and just print something steam client is not valid 
just like that. We can throw an exception. Just like that. And that'll basically just throw us into this little exception here. And we'll need to, to keep track of this. And I'll probably do some changes down here. So after we've checked, made sure everything's valid, let's come down here and start setting up our actual player information here. Okay, so first we want to get a hold of our player name. So come up here and let's just say public string player name. And we will go ahead and just say get semicolon set semicolon. And then down here, now that we know this is valid, let's pull our information. So we'll say player name is equal to steam client dot name. And that'll pull back our Steam client's name. So we need to make a Steam ID. So we'll say public Steam ID. And we will pass in player Steam ID. And we're going to say get comma set semicolon. Keep saying comma. We also need to have a way to know if we're connected to Steam. So we'll say private bool connected to Steam get semicolon set just like that. And we'll come down here and we'll just say player steam ID is equal to steam client dot steam ID. And I know you could probably just reference this wherever you want, but it'd be nice to have everything, you know, be abstracted up to my steam manager. That way I have a smaller amount of data to work with. And it's just a little bit easier and more organized if I just kind of keep it all in a manager, if that makes sense. So, then we can set our connected to steam is equal to true and we should be good to go. Now we should also notify us that we are connected to steam. So steam is connected and I'm going to pass back my player name. So actually we can just say player name is that which works. There we go. And for our catch here, we'll just say connected to Steam is equal to false. And we can just print our error here. So we'll get rid of our throw and we'll just say system.exception E, just like that. And we will say gd.printe.message, just like that. And actually, we should probably have some kind of human readable thing here. So error connect to steam and plus e dot message and that will give us an error in case we have a problem now if we go back to godot here and we hit play and we select our current scene which we actually can't if because i haven't saved this so hit Control s and let's just call this main scene for right now and we will hit play select current and you'll see, hey, hold on, we have an error. Uh, error connecting to Steam assembly, unknown assembly, unknown type member null. So that's not good. Okay, so I figured out what my issue was. It looks like we have to copy our Steam API and our API 64. We can either cut it or copy it and paste it into our main folder here. And then if we hit play, you should see Steam is connected, player name, find point CGI, and you should see this little pop-up right here. If this pop-up has happened, that means your Steamworks is hooked up correctly, that you've set up all of your stuff correctly, and that we have our actual app ID correct. So once you get to this point, everything is basically easy. So now that we have ourselves connecting, and we can hit shift tab and we can actually see our steam overlay just like this and it works. So now that we have ourselves connecting and we actually are connected to steam, we need to maintain that connection. So we're going to need to do some callbacks. So let's close our project. Let's click our script. Let's come down here into our process and let's uncomment this. So just type comment remove line comment and then let's just say steam client dot run callbacks and that's just going to allow us to run our callbacks now for the most part this doesn't matter if you're not doing online 
but it's just a good idea to do it so that way we have ourselves running our callbacks and making sure that everything's running. Now, next, what we have to do is we need to make sure we properly shut our Steam client down. So we need to run some stuff when our project closes. So what we'll do is we'll shut down uh, Steam when our um, application quits. So we'll say public override void underscore notification. And we will say if what is equal to main loop dot notification. And you'll see we have a bunch of notifications here. And you really can use these notifications for a lot of really cool stuff. So for instance, if you focus in or focus out. So for instance, if you were playing a game and you didn't want to tie up their resources when they are outside of the game, you could actually say on focus out, uh, restrict their FPS to something like 15, right? And that might be useful, for instance, if you're playing an MMO and you're just kind of waiting for some stuff to be sold in the item store, right? You could say on focus out, make it 15 FPS. So that way it's not killing their GPU when they are not in your game. The same thing with focus in, right? You could do the same thing. You know, mouse enter and mouse exit is when it enters and exits the actual application, right? But the one that we're looking for is quit request right here. So we'll do WM quit request. And we will say steam client dot shut down and that will shut down our steam client. So that way we can officially, you know, shut down our stuff. And then we need to uh, quit our tree. So we'll say get tree dot quit. And that will allow us to quit our game. Now we don't necessarily need to do this, but I like to do it just cause it's cleaner. Um, but it's up to you if you want to add that. Now I'm going to tab this guy in. So it just kind of flows better. And at this point, we basically have our basic steam integration done, right? We have the ability to interact with steam at this point. We've logged in. We are pretty much good to go. So what we'll do is we're going to get a lot of our friends, right? We need to pull down our friends and we'll go ahead and print them out in our console. So that way we can see all of our friends. And I'm going to show you some of the cool friend interactions that we can do here. So first I'm going to right click up here. I'm going to add a child node. I'll add in a control node, just like that. We're going to make it about yay big. We're going to right click on it, attach a script and call it steam interface. And we will create that. Now, in general, the Steam interface, I'm just going to have it house like all the different Steam functions that we can use. So things like cloud saving, you know, getting our friends, getting our user account, unlocking achievements, um, doing leaderboard stuff, stuff like that. So that way we can actually see, you know, how it works and stuff like that. Um, the steam manager, we're basically just going to have it for all of our online use. So registering with steam, creating, um, servers, lobbies, and kind of running our games, if that makes sense. So that's going to be the two big distinctions is this is basically just us interfacing with achievements and stuff like that. And this is going to interface with more of the back end and more of, of how, um, networking will work. Okay. And if we have time, we'll actually do networking in this one. If not, then there's going to be a part two. So we'll come to steam interface and we'll need to actually, um, get our friends. So let's go over here. Let's right click our control node. Let's add in a child node. Let's add in a button just like that. And we'll make it about this big and we'll drag it to about here ish. And we will just say text. And in our text field, we'll just say, get friends, or maybe I should say print friends. I think that'd be easier. And next, what we'll do is we will connect our button to our, uh, control node and we'll rename our button print friends, just like that. And we will go over to node button down on print friends button down. We'll copy this. We'll click on our control node and hit connect. And then we'll hit enter, enter tab, and we'll say public void on print fence button down. And we will say for each 
var friend in steam friends and you will see that steam friends doesn't exist and that's because we're not using steam works and that should bring it in so we'll say steam friends dot get and you could see all of the options we have here and i don't really know if we can go through all of them but we have things like we can get all of your blocked users we can get all of your clans we can get your follower count, followers list. We can get your friends right here, which is what we'll be using. Get friends, clan members, get friends on game server, get friends requests, get friends requesting friendship, get uh, avatars, get played with, get rich presents. You can really get a lot of really cool stuff here. So you can actually pull back like when they send you a lobby request, you could actually make it so that it pops up and says, hey, they've sent you a lobby request, right? And things like that. So you can get a really, really cool stuff here. But in our case, we're just going to get our friends. So we'll pull get friends. And then what we'll say is for each of these guys, gd.print. And we'll pass in our friend ID. So we'll just grab this. Friend.id. And then we'll say colon friend dot name just like that and you'll also notice that when we get back our friends if i go friend dot you can see we can actually get a lot of information we can pull back their achievements their unlock time their hash code their avatar pictures their rich presence we can get their avatar async we can get their stats we can get um their id which i pulled back here we can actually invite them to a game. We can check if they are in a game, if they're busy, if they are your friends. Like you can really pull back a lot of data. You can even send them messages. You can actually send them Steam messages through here, which is pretty crazy. But in our case, we're just going to pull back their name. So we'll just say name and we'll put a semicolon just like that. So now if I hit control S, I tab, I save my main scene, I hit play. You will see that I have my print friends button here. So I'm going to click that and you'll see that I get all sorts of friend names and their actual IDs just like that. And it's really that simple. I just pulled back all of my friends on my friends list that easy. So what can we do with this? Well, if I come in here and I say, if friend name is equal to and i believe his name is hunter let's see yep right here hunter if his name is hunter then i'm going to friend dot send message and i'm going to say hello from steam works tutorial exclamation point exclamation point just like that and if i come in here and I click print friends, just like that, you will see that if I hit shift tab, you will see that I have a message sent to my friend Hunter here. Hello from Steamworks tutorial. And it's really that simple. So you can really do a lot of really cool stuff here with this system. You can actually just do pretty much anything you want with their friends list. Steam makes it super open for you. So that way you can do basically whatever you want. So you want to be really cautious and not abuse this stuff because if you actually abuse it and start sending out messages or trying to get people to buy the game through the um, message system or you try sending out friend requests or stuff like that, you're going to want to be cautious about that because Steam doesn't take that lightly and they will ban you. So you just want to be cautious of that. Now, next, we'll talk about how to get achievements. So first, we will add in a button. So we'll right-click our control node, add in a child node. Let's add in a second button here. Let's just drag it down here, about make it about yay big. And let's just call it get achievements just like that and we'll come over here go to our our inspector and we'll just say get achievements right just like that and we'll go to our node and we'll go on button down and we will attach it to our control node let's copy this like usual hit connect 
and come down here and say public void and paste that in. And for us to get our achievements, we need to first pull them from Steam. So we'll say var achievements is equal to Steam user stats dot, and you will see that we have a bunch of options here. So the Steam user stats is used for achievements, and it also is used for leaderboards as well. So if you look at this, you can see we have like achievements, we have add stats, we have equals, find a leaderboard, find or create leaderboard, and get stats. Basically, the Steam user stats is used for anything that has to do with Steam user stats. I, I know that that's a terrible way to put it, but that's basically what it is. So you can store stats, you can request stats, you can uh, get the player count of a specific room with this. And you also have some signals here. So you can actually, you know, check when an achievement gets progress. You can actually notify them of the progress. You can say, oh, you know, you're 25% of the way done with this, you know, with headshotting all of these uh, monsters, right? Or you can say, um, you know, when we receive stats or when stats are stored, you can actually check for those right here as well. Now, in our case, we'll do the leaderboard next, but... We just want to go to our achievements. So we'll say dot achievements and we will put a semicolon. And now that we have our achievements, we need to print them out. So we'll say for each achievement in achievements, then we'll print them. So we'll say GD dot print and we'll go dollar sign quote and we will say achievement we will say achievement dot and you'll see that we have a bunch of options here so we can pull back the description we can pull back if they're uh, unlocked we can pull back the identifier the, the name the state and when they unlocked it last now in our case we're just going to pull back the name and we will put in also the state so we'll say achievement dot state just like that now, in my case, I already have an achievement built, but I will show you guys how to build an achievement in one second. So if we run this, in your guys' case, you're going to get back nothing. If you click on this, you will see that there are no achievements. In my case, it says that there is one, and that's because I have a test achievement that I've already built for this, uh, for my own testing, right, to show how this works but you guys will probably get nothing back. And the reason why is because we don't actually have any achievements built. So how can we actually build achievements? Well, if we come up to our Steamworks and here's our Steamworks page, if we come down here, you will see that there is a edit Steamworks settings. This is where you define your achievements. This is where you set your steam pipes, your installation settings, your workshop settings, any keys or anything like that, and how you actually publish your app. This is also where you get your name and what type it is. So, you know, when you fill out your application, you actually can come in here and set up like, hey, this is Steamworks tutorial. It is a game. Um, it is a specific app ID. It has specific localizations and it has specific localization files, things like that. You can also set where your operating system is and whether or not it is visible. And in my case, it is not visible because obviously I don't have a landing page or anything like that. Although hopefully when we do our spooky game, we can actually fully build this out and actually put it out on Steam. Now, if I head up here and I go over to stats and achievements. Now, stats are used to actually keep track of specific things. So for instance... If you had number of headshots, right, that the user has before they can unlock an achievement, you could store that to your hard drive, right, which is a totally valid way to do it. You can just save it out to the hard drive and go from there. Or you can actually use the stats configuration system and you could basically just save it out here. Okay, so it's really nice if you want to track game data such as achievement data or, um, you know, rewarding the user for spending more time in the game, things like that. Um, it's really useful. Uh, generally speaking, I would just save it to my hard drive because I'm 
not sure I'd need to use this, but you can if you want to. Now, if we come up here and we go to achievements, you can see that I have a single test achievement. Simple enough, right? Now, you can see that we have a small thing here that says basically, hey, you can define your achievements. And for best results, it should be a 256 by 256 JPEG image, but it could be as small as 64 by 64 and blah, 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 blah. And that's all fine. But in your guys' case, you probably don't have any achievements yet. But if you click new achievement, you'll be able to build an achievement. Now, you have to first set a name. And this name is not the description name. This is the actual API name. So this is the name that you're going to be calling out in your code. So in my case, I'm just going to call it tutorial achievement. And for the title, I'm going to say tutorial achievement. And for the description, I'm going to say, hey, you unlocked the tutorial achievement how did you do that and we'll say that it's set by our client now gs and official gs means it's set by the game server or official game server so this is useful if you want the server to actually give them an achievement versus allowing the client to do it hidden basically determines if you want it to be hidden or if you don't want it to be hidden in my case i don't need it to be hidden i think it's fine the next option is achieved icon and you can see that i don't actually have an achieved icon for my test achievement but if we wanted to upload one it has to be in 256 by 256 pixels and it needs to be a jpeg image now in my case my icon is actually just the right size for this. So I will click on choose file. I'm going to go into my pictures here and I will pull my me.jpg and we'll just use that. And I will click upload and it should. And it looks like we have to save it. There's an error uploading image. The application data is missing. Please save the achievement before adding it. So first let's get that settled so you can see we have progress stat none and this is basically saying if we want to index it to a progress stat if you remember when we talked about stats you can actually select them here and say minimum value is this max value is this for them to get that achievement now since we didn't set that we don't need that so if we come over here and click save and we save it and then we click edit and we choose a file choose me click on that hit upload there we go. And then choose a new icon of my completion. And I don't know, I guess we'll use, I don't think I actually have an icon. So hold on one moment. Generally speaking, when you do these icons, you want to actually put like a gray scale over it. So I'll just grab this and I'll just make it gray, something like that. And I'll just drag my opacity down something like, I don't know like that or something. And then we'll hit file, save as, and we'll just save this out as a JPEG, just like that. And we'll just say me on. Me not unlocked, we'll say. And we'll just save that. And let me come over here and set me over here. And then let's change this me to me not unlocked, just like that. We'll upload me not unlocked and we'll upload me unlocked as well. And that should do it. There we go. Hit save. And it should, providing that it wants to, let's see if this works. Hopefully. There we go. Hit save. There we go. So now you can see we have the two. And now one of the things about steam that's funky is you always have to publish your changes to their cdn system okay so if you come up here you can see there's a publish button so if you click on that and you click prepare for publishing publish to steam and then type in steam works now i just have my thing autofill it because it's easier but your first time you'll probably need to type steam works in all caps and basically what this does is it's it's publishing this to the steam servers. Okay. And you can see you have view all pending changes in history, which basically allows us to check all of our history view diffs allows you to check if there's any diffs 
revert changes allows you to revert it to your unpublished previous published way and push apps to CDN basically pushes your data to the CDN prepare for publishing just checks to see if it's good and publish to steam will publish it to steam and then you need to tell them really publish now this internal changes here is for your team so this isn't something that uh users are going to see this is for us to see you don't have to put anything in there if you don't want to but you can and a lot of times if people are looking through the commit history of your cdn then you know it's nice to see okay hey this is good to go or this isn't good to go and this uses perforce to do its um publishing uh changes so we'll click really publish and it will publish our changes and you'll see that it says hey you can actually post or manage announcements which means you would be able to tell your players of any changes that this is so basically you're going to use this publish changes anytime you want to publish your game's changes. So it could be things like adding achievements. It could be things like pushing a new version of the game. It could be something as simple as adding something to the workshop. You will always need to publish your changes so that way uh, Steam knows what's going on. And then you can always notify your players. Now in our case, I don't have any players to notify, so I'm not gonna do that, but you can do that if you need to. Now, if I go and we hit the play icon first, we come over here and we hit shift tab. You will see that it says that, hey, you've earned one of two achievements. So we've actually added our achievement successfully. We have our test achievement and then our other achievement. If we hit view all achievements, it's going to just take you to your ID. And the reason why is because um, the system doesn't know that your achievements are up there because you haven't made your game public. So until you make your game public, you can't just uh, see it on your Steam profile, if that makes sense. So we'll hit Shift tab. We'll click Get Achievements, and you will notice that we actually now have a test achievement and a tutorial achievement. Perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. So now how can we actually achieve an achievement? We grab this button and we duplicate it and drag it down and rename this and say, achieve test achievement, let's say, just like that. And we disconnect this, right click it, connect to our control node. I'm gonna copy this and connect. And then I will say, public void on achieve test achievement button down just like that then we just need to get a reference to what our achievement is that we're actually getting so we can just say var test achievement is equal to new achievement and you will notice that we're not getting auto completion and an achievement is a Steamworks item, but it's a Steamworks data item. So we'll say using steamworks.data. Then now if we scroll down, you'll see that this should, ACH achievement like that, it does autocomplete. And now we need to tell it what the achievement is, okay? And in our case, it's the achievement ID. So if we come back to publishing, and we go back to our achievements section, you will see that we have an API progress stat, which is right here, tutorial achievement and test achievement. So if we grab tutorial achievement, we copy it, and we go back here and we paste that in. Now we will have a reference to it. So now we can trigger it. So we can say test achievement dot trigger, just like that. So now if we go back to our game here, we close this and we actually change this from get achievements to achieve test achievement and we hit play and we hit achieve test achievement. You'll see achievement unlocked tutorial achievement, which I may have spelled achievement wrong, but that's fine. Um, and you will see that if I close these guys, you will see tutorial achievement. Most recent I have achieved. Hey, you unlocked our achievement. How did you do that? And it's really that simple. 
Now you'll notice that if you click it again, nothing happens. Now, why is that? And the reason why is because you can't achieve an achievement that's already been achieved. Okay. And if it's already been achieved, then Steam just says, no, this guy's already achieved it. So he's not going to get the achievement notification. And that's really nice because that means you don't have to do any defensive coding where you're saying, if achievement is not achieved, then go ahead and achieve it. It doesn't matter. You could just say, yeah, fire it off. It's good to go. Right. So if you were to say, oh, you've completed this level. So therefore you get this achievement, right? You could just fire it off. And if they haven't achieved it, they'll achieve it. And if they have achieved it, it doesn't matter. The system doesn't care. So that's one of the nice things about it. Now, your question might next be, okay, but what if I want to test that achievement, right? Because sometimes you want to just test it again, right? And make sure that it works. And that's where clearing an achievement uh, comes in. So inside of Steam, you can actually remove achievements from people, which is kind of crazy. So if you think about it, you can actually remove people's achievements uh, that they've already achieved from their account uh, if if you want to. So you can come in here and just say test achievement dot clear and that will clear their achievement from being achieved. So if you come over here and you hit play, I can click it again. And you will see that nothing's happened. But if I hit shift tab, you will see that I have earned my two out of two. And if I click it one more time, you will see that I have unlocked the achievement. So I can actually just spam and unlock as many of these as I want. And it will always be cleared after I'm completed. So you could have a lot of fun if you really wanted to be evil and just say, oh, you've completed the level. So I'm going to um, give you the achievement. And then you could have a penalty where they suddenly lose that achievement because, you know, they died or something like that. So it's kind of cool that you actually have access to that. Now, in our case, I don't really need to clear my achievement, but I'll leave it in there for you guys for when you guys want to check out the code. And we can take a look at some of the other things that we have here. So if we type test achievement dot, you can see some of the cool stuff we have. So we have stuff like clear description so I could pull the description. I can get back its current state when we last unlocked it and if it is globally unlocked or not. So those are some of the options that we have here. Now I'm going to get rid of this because we don't need it, but that's basically all you need to know about achievements is that they're really not that difficult to unlock. You literally just get a reference and trigger it. It's that simple. So now the next big question you might be asking is, okay, well you showed us achievements, right? How can we do leaderboards, right? Cause sometimes when you're playing games, you want to have leaderboards that people, you know, you, you have like a racing game or something. You want to have a global leaderboard that everybody is uh, vying for the fastest time, right? So how can we actually have a global leaderboard? Well, if you come up to stats and achievements and you come down to leaderboards, a, you'll see that. I have one right here called scores. Actually, I have two of them, global scores and scores, and we can actually delete both of these. So let's get rid of both of them just like that. And you can create leaderboards in two separate ways. So the first one is through this global scores like that. And we can have a community name called global scores. And you probably shouldn't have spaces in your name. So we'll just actually get rid of that space right there. And you could say what type of a, uh, sorting method you want. So you could say, I want it ascending or descending. And you can have it based off of numerics, seconds, or milliseconds. And you can set whether it is writable or readable. You set this to trusted. What it's going to do is it's going to say only trusted sources can write to this which basically means only web API clients can actually connect to this and write to it. And same thing with read, you can actually say only friends or everybody, right? In my case, this is set up so that it's for global for everyone to write to it, but you could set this so that only trusted people can write to it and only your friends can read it, right? So you can actually see just your friends, right? 
stuff like that. Now, in my case, I don't need any of that. So we're just going to click create and you will see that uh, we have created a leaderboard. Now we have to refresh our page and there you go. It exists. Now, the other way that we can create a leaderboard is if we go into Godot here and into our code, we can actually just create a leaderboard. So we'll say private async void create leader board. Okay. And I know you're going, well, hold on. Why are we doing async? The reason why we're doing async is because we don't want to block the Godot working thread with our code because it's going to need to fetch out to the internet and create the leaderboard and get back an acknowledgement saying, Hey, yep, you've successfully created a leaderboard. Okay. And you don't want to block your thread because if you do, your entire game is going to freeze until that leaderboard is created. And you don't want that. Now, how do we create a leaderboard? Well, first we need to create a variable and we'll say leaderboard is equal to, and we're going to await the creation of our leaderboard. So we'll say steam user stats dot find leaderboard or create leaderboard a sync. And we will see if scores exist. Now, if this was something that is specific to your player or specific to a group of players, you may want to make this into something like the username dash scores, right? So if I wanted to make this very specific to my character, I could do something like dollar sign, you know, um, bracket, bracket. And then I can say something like, I believe I called it uh, steam manager dot manager dot. And I believe I called it player name or steam ID. So I could say something like player steam ID space scores, right? And that would give me a unique enough name that nobody would ever get this uh, player steam ID scores. And then you could actually search for that specific person's leaderboard. Now, in my case, we don't need this. We're just going to make a global leaderboard. So we'll just get rid of that and we'll just say scores. Now we need to pass in how we're going to sort it. So we'll hit comma leaderboard sort dot. And we'll say ascending in our case, if you want descending, you could do descending. And we'll also need to set what our leaderboard display is. So we'll say leaderboard display, and we're going to just do numeric. If you had something like a time frame or something like that, you could do time in seconds or milliseconds. But in my case, I'm just going to do leaderboard.numeric. And then we'll come in here and we will go ahead and hit control S and we'll come into Godot here just like this. We are going to right click our control node, add a child node. Let's add in a button and let's just kind of drag it down here. We'll make it about this big, give or take, and we'll say create leader board, just like that. And I'm going to rename this to create leader board, just like that. And I will go to my node. I will attach it to my button down, copy this and connect, and then say, public void, paste it, and we will say create leaderboard. So now if we come over here and we hit play and we click create leaderboard, you will see that we don't get anything back. There's nothing that tells us that that leaderboard was created. Now you can tell it to inform you by just coming in here and saying leaderboard dot, and you can see if it has a value, right? You could just say has value. And if it has a valid value, then you're good to go, right? You could say, yep, I have a value. And then you could say leaderboard created, right? In our case, we don't really need that because we don't need that validation unless you want that validation. Um, if we head out to our leaderboard and we refresh, though, you will see we have a scores leaderboard. Simple enough, right? Now, what if we wanted to add a value to our leaderboard? Now, this is where things get interesting because a lot of times when you submit your leaderboard, you may want to find or create. See how it says find or create? So what this does is it actually finds the leaderboard or creates it. So if you wanted to, you could take this create leaderboard, come in here and just say, if leaderboard dot, oh, I spelled leaderboard wrong. There we go. Leaderboard. I don't know why I had that extra R. 
leaderboard dot has value then let's just submit a value we'll say var steam leaderboard is equal to leaderboard dot value and what that's doing is since this is an an, an a a weighted task what it does is it returns if you if i hover over this it actually returns an awaitable. It actually returns a task leaderboard question mark, okay? And basically what that means is since this is an asynchronous call, we don't actually fetch out our uh, leaderboard object. We're actually fetching out a reference to that leaderboard object that may or may not exist, okay? That's what that little question mark actually means. So if you see this little question mark right here, that means that this may exist. It doesn't mean that it's going to exist. So that's why we can't just say a leaderboard leaderboard because while this may not exist, right? You would have to cast it to a leaderboard. But since we don't necessarily know if it's going to have a value, we don't want our code to crash. So that's why we pass a var instead because we're not sure if it's going to be a leaderboard. Now we could pass in a leaderboard question mark and that would be acceptable because we're saying, well, this leaderboard may or may not exist. So that's basically kind of the funkiness about this. So we need to make sure that we have a leaderboard that does exist and set it equal to that uh, leaderboard that may exist. Does that make sense? So basically we're saying if it exists, then assign it to something that says, yep, this exists. I know this is here. Okay. And what we can do is we can submit our score. So we can say steam leaderboard dot submit score async. And we'll just pass in a 10 and say that, yep, they've submitted a score of 10. Okay. Now we are not awaiting this. And the reason why we're not awaiting this is because we don't necessarily need to, but you could await it if you wanted to, so you could just say await, and you can see that it does return, like I've said before, a leaderboard update. So you can actually determine if your uh, leaderboard has submitted a score. So you could just say something like leaderboard update question mark update is equal to our await. And that would basically allow us to determine like, hey, did this come back safely? Are we okay? Are we good to go? And you can actually come in here and just say, if update dot has value, and then you can just say leader board update you is equal to update dot value. And then we can grab our you dot, and then you can see all the different events we have here. Now, basically what this is, and you can see that we have a bunch of options here. Now, first one has changed whether or not it has changed. We can see if it equals something or it gets their type, right? But what's cool is we can see their new global rank and their old global rank. So if you push out a value, you can see what their rank is. So I'm going to grab their new global rank and I'm just going to print that. So I'm going to say gd.print new global rank and I will put quote your global rank is and I will pass that in and we'll put dot to string so that way we actually have this as a string value and that way when we submit an update it will tell us what our global rank is now that we have this we can actually come in here and do some some error handling. Okay. If we don't have a value, if our update doesn't have a value, something broke, right? So we can say else gd dot print error can't submit leaderboard score, just like that exclamation point. And then we can come down here and say else gd.print leaderboard does not exist exclamation point just like that there we go so basically we now have the ability to create a leaderboard submit a score and 
check what their global ranking is. So if I come in here and I go to Godot, just like this, and I refresh this, and I click create leaderboard, your global rank is one. And if I come over here and I look at my leaderboard and I refresh it, and I click view scores, you'll see that I am ranked one. Fine point CGI, score of 10. Now, what happens if we submit a different score? So let's say I play this again and I get a score of 100. That's a good question. So let's find out. So let's say you just got a score of 100. And then we come back to Godot and we hit play and we click create leaderboard. You'll see it says your global ranking is 100. We come over here, we hit enter and we view our scores. You will see that we have just the 10. If I actually refresh this again, right? Because you can't believe your eyes. I have 10, but I submitted a score that says 100, right? You can see it in our code. It says it right here. Steam interface, um, we are submitting a score that says 100. And if we even try this again, just to see, you know, what, what could possibly be wrong, right? This is a common problem that I've seen people uh, talk about is if I submit a score, even though I'm submitting my score and it says my global rank is one and it's passed back properly, it doesn't actually allow you to update your score once it's been submitted through the submit score you actually have to tell it to replace the score. So you actually have to come in here and say, steam leaderboard dot replace score. And then you can pass in your score. So you could say something like in this case, a hundred. And that would allow you to actually um, send out your replacement. So if I take this and I go leaderboard update, if I comment that out in a second, like this and I comment this out and I hit control S and I type await just like that. If I close this and I go back to Godot and I hit play and I click create leaderboard, it'll say your global ranking is one, like we would expect. If I come back to steam and I hit refresh and I hit scores, you will see that I now have my score of 100. So you need to make sure that you replace their score over submitting their score. So I know what you're thinking. What if I want to submit my score or replace my score, right? Because it's not exactly fair that we have to submit our score and then we can't just, we can't just replace it if it doesn't exist right? or if it already exists, right? Well, that's where replace score comes in. Replace score actually will insert your score as well. So if I come in here and I delete this score and I get rid of it, and then I come back to Godot and I hit play and I fire this off, you will see you get a your global rank is number one. And if we come to Steamworks and we refresh our page, you will see that we've submitted our score as well. So replace score is kind of a bad name because it really technically is re submit or replace score. So that's just something to keep in mind. So really you don't need this unless you were to say, I only want you to be allowed to submit your score once. So if you, for instance, had a game where your first time playing through, you only get to submit your score that first time. You could continue playing the game and you can, you know, check out, uh, you know, the game and get better at it, but you can only submit one time. That's where submit score kind of comes in. So that's kind of the, the difference between the two. So next we can submit our scores, but how would we get our actual leaderboard scores? Well, to do that, we need to actually fetch our scores. So first let's head over to Godot here and let's right click, add in a child and let's add in a button. And what we'll do is we will come down here and we'll fetch our scores, okay? And we will come in here to our inspector. On text, we'll say fetch leader board scores, just like that. And then we will come to our button, we'll rename it to fetch leader board scores. And then we will attach our button down to our control node and we will go ahead and paste it right here. So we'll say public void, fetch our leaderboard scores. 
And what we have to do is we have to go and actually fetch our leaderboard. So first we could basically just grab this find or create leaderboard, right? We could just fetch this. And if we want to, since we don't necessarily want to create a leaderboard, we could just say fetch leaderboard. We could actually just come down here and hit dot find leaderboard async, and then we could just pass in our leaderboard. We know our scores leaderboard exists, so we could just do that. Or if you feel like it, you could also, of course, just go with find or create. That's totally fine. Now you'll see that we have a squirrely brace right here, squiggly lines underneath here, and that's because this is not an async function. So how can we solve that? Well, we need to make an async function. So we'll say private async void get leaderboard score. And we can basically just pass that in. And I'm typing with GD script because for some reason my brain thought this was a GD script tutorial. And then we can just say if leaderboard dot has value, then we can say leaderboard dot leaderboard current leaderboard is equal to leaderboard dot value and then we can say current leaderboard dot and you can see that we have all of our options here now we can actually just fetch get scores async just like that now we can't just say uh, get our scores, right? We need to tell them how many scores we want. So we'll just grab our top 10 scores, which will be totally fine. And we need it to return something. So normally what this returns is a task of leaderboard entry. So we can say leaderboard entry array question mark entries is equal to this. And that should about do it. And I think I might need to move my question mark there instead. There we go. And then we will need to await our little function here. Oh, actually, it looks like we don't need the question mark. There we go. And then we can just go ahead and print our entries. So for each bar item in entries, gd dot print and then we can type item dot and then you can see we have a bunch of options here we have our global rank our score and our user so what i'll do is i will pass in a dollar sign quote bracket item dot global rank bracket space item dot name or dot user i think it's actually called dot user there we go. And then we can go space item dot score. And that'll give us a nice, good, solid um, scoreboard here. So we'll hit control S and then we need to call it. So we'll come up here and we'll say get leaderboard score just like that. And then if we test this, hopefully it'll work. So we'll go ahead and hit play. We'll drag this over into the center, hit fetch leaderboard score, and you will see fine point CGI my user ID, and then I have a score of 100. So if I wanted to, I could say, okay, let's populate our um, scoreboard with that bit of data there. And that's basically how we can do it, nice and simple. Now, the last thing that we're gonna take a look at is we're gonna talk about how to do cloud saving with Steam. So first, I'll show you guys kind of how to do it manually, and then we'll talk about how to do it automatically. Steam actually has a built-in way that can save our data automatically, which is really cool and super useful. So first, we have to come up here and create a button. So first, to do this manually, we have to come up here and create a button. So we'll right-click, add in a child node, and let's add in a button, just like that. We're going to expand it about yay yay big and we're going to drag it down here and let's just kind of make it i don't know about the right size and we'll call it save to cloud and i spelled cloud wrong 
There we go. And we are going to change this name to save to cloud, just like that. And then we're going to also need a load cloud. So we'll just grab that and just type load from cloud as well. Just like that. And I will grab this and do that. Awesome. So now we have to connect our signals as usual. So we'll come up here, click, click button down, go to our control node. We're going to copy this as usual, come down here and create our function just like that. And then we'll do the same thing here, button down, connect it to our control node, copy that little bit right there. And then we are going to come down here and paste it in just like that. So now I know what you might be asking, how do we actually save our data, right? Well, with Steam Cloud, we have to uh, have a text file to save. You can't just save out to the cloud and just say, I wanna save a value. Um, in some saving systems, they allow for that. But unfortunately with this system, you really can't do it that way. So what we have to do is we have to save our stuff out to a file. So what we'll do is we'll come in here and we'll go to our save cloud button and we will say bar file contents encoding dot. And you'll see that I'm not getting any auto completion. That's because we got to import this. So if we click on this guy, click on our little icon here and do use system.txt encoding dot get bytes like that. And then we'll pass in our value of something that we want to save. Now, if you have JSON data or something like that, you can save it here. But in our case, I'm just going to write a file that says test to it. And then we can say steam remote storage dot file write right there and we'll pass in a value so we'll just say file.txt or we could call this save.txt that would work as well so actually i think maybe that would be a better one save.txt comma file contents and that will allow us to save our data out on the steam remote storage now if we want to load that data we can say var file contents is equal to steam remote storage dot file read and we have to pass in our value so save dot txt now generally speaking what i would suggest is if you are going to do this i would save it with the user name dash like save right or something like that because you want to make sure that it's unique just in case it's not user specific, which in this case, I don't believe it is. So you'll want to be cautious not to just save it as save because multiple people could pull down the same save data and that would be a problem. So we'll do that and then we'll say gd.print our file contents and that should come back if I remember correctly, and we can hover over this real quick, this comes back as a byte array. So it's going to come back as a byte of data. So it should print out uh, numbers instead of actual uh, data. And we'll talk about how to convert that in a second, but I just want to show you guys how this works. So I'm going to save. And I'm going to make sure I'm logged into Steam, which I should be. And then if we hit play and we hit save to cloud, You'll see that we get nothing, right? We have no, no return saying that it was successful. If we hit load from cloud, you'll see we have system.byte. So that's perfect. That's what we want because that means we got our byte array back. Now, I'm going to take a few seconds to sit down and explain what a byte array is because a lot of this is probably new to you guys. So first, we are taking our text named test and we are converting it to what's called a byte array. And a byte array is an array of bytes. You know, that's, that doesn't help, right? But what a byte array is, is it's an array of data that we have. So we took that word 
test and we converted it to a generic data type called bytes. And, and basically everything, every data type can be converted to a byte array. And we're going to get really hardcore in depth into this when we get into the networking side of this in the next tutorial. But just know that basically you're taking this data and you're converting it into bytes, into structured numbers that represent the word test. And then we are saving it out to our Steam remote storage. So you can take this data and convert it, um, convert integers or convert objects. You can convert player data, things like that. Um, and you just have to basically look at how to convert an object to a byte array and you can find out how to do this, right? Now, in our case, we're just saving text, so it's simple. Now, in our case, we're going to be converting a byte array to a string. So what we can do is we can just grab this file content and we can just say encoding dot default dot get string and there we go and that should fetch our string from our byte array now if we actually take a look at this encoding dot default and we take a look at some of the options here you can see that we actually have a lot of stuff we have get byte count get bytes get char count get chars get decoder get encoder get max byte uh count get char count get preamble get string and get type and so basically the nice thing is, is if we want to get back more than just you know a string we can actually get back lots of different types of data here so it's really nice and it's useful for us to know that these exist at least for byte arrays now if we go ahead and test this i'm going to save and then open up here we'll go ahead and open this up and let's see what this does so we've already saved our data to the cloud so if we click load from cloud you'll see we have the word test so that's how we can get data to and from the steam cloud servers now something to keep in mind we do need to make sure that uh we go out to our steam and we go out to steam cloud and we make sure that uh, this quota is a high number um, because each user has a specific quota and a specific number of files. So you can set this up to, to whatever, but generally speaking, you're going to want to make sure that you don't set too much or too little because Steam can get really upset about that kind of stuff. So just make sure that you set it up, you know, properly. And since we're already over here, let's talk about auto cloud and auto cloud is steam's cloud functionality that automatically synchronizes your data. Okay. Now, some of you may have had errors and if you do have errors, just make sure you check this guy right here to enable cloud support. Um, it may or may not be already checked for you, but um if it doesn't work for you this is a option to check if, if uh the code previously didn't work check this out make sure that it's checked uh for me it was by default it might not be for you now there are some other options okay you can see there is dynamic cloud syncing and dynamic cloud syncing is super useful because it allows people to to suspend and synchronize their games at runtime. So while you're running the game, it'll actually synchronize that data. And you can actually turn this on or off right here. Um, you'll want to be careful because, you know, if you utilize this method and somehow the data gets interrupted on copying, it's going to corrupt their system. So you're going to want to be cautious about that. They'll lose all their game saves. If you want to share Steam Cloud data with another game, you can do that right here by just giving it a special game app ID, and that'll basically handle your saving. Now, next is the big feature that I was talking about earlier, which is the auto cloud configuration. Now, the nice thing about this is you don't have to do what I just showed you guys, which was uh, creating a small save system right here. You don't have to do this to actually get cloud saving to work. You can actually just use Steam's auto cloud as well to do it. You know, what you would do is you would just save to your, to your file system, and then it will automatically back that file system up 
to the cloud. So how we can do that is basically we just come down here to say new auto cloud path. And you will see that we have a directory right here. So what this allows is if you take a look at the subdirectory here, this is your save directory. So you could just say saves dir or something like that. And it will automatically save all of the files in that directory that has this pattern. So if you were to say something like uh, asterisk dot save, that means all files that have the save extension are going to be synchronized with Steam's cloud. If you come in here and you can actually edit this and have it so that it saves uh, a different format or a different file. And you can see it says all OS's, recursive and cross-platform. So if we click on the edit button, you can see that we have lots of things we can edit here. So under app install directory, you can actually click on this and you can see there are all sorts of stuff here. So for instance, if you wanted to save app data local or app data local low or app data roaming, you can actually do that here. So in Godot's case, if you come over to Godot here and you click on project and open user data folder, you can see that we have our stuff out in app data roaming, Godot, app user data, Steamworks tutorial, right? Because it's my Steamworks tutorial. If we come over to cloud, you can see that we can actually choose our app data local, just like that. And that will allow us to save our app data local, which in our case, our stuff is in app data roaming. So we could actually come in here and say app data roaming, and then you can choose a sub directory. So you could say something like app user data and here's all my different tutorials. So we'll just type S Steamworks tutorial. And then we can just select this entire path just like this. And then come back to where our app data roaming is just like this. And that should save our Steamworks data. Now it's only going to save in the pattern of dot save. So if we wanted to save everything in there, we could just do asterisk dot asterisk. Now, the only downside to doing it this way is if we did that, we would be saving our logs as well. And we might not want to do that because why would we want to save our logs for our users? So we might want to exclude the logs folder or we may just want to keep a specific pattern. Now, in our case, we could just keep it as save. That's fine. And you could turn on recursive. And what recursive does is it will pull any subfolders for that dot save extension. So if, for example, you are saving all of your user data in, um, you know, save slash user slash there's all their saved data. And then you also have one for enemies, which is enemies slash all their saved data. Recursive is useful because then you can go into those uh, subfolders and pull that data back. And cross-platform is important. Cross-platform basically means can your stuff work cross-platform. And in this case, since this is Win App Data Roaming, you would only want this to work on Windows. You would not want this to do it on Linux or Mac. You'd have to go and find the Linux and Mac um, app directories for this. And that's basically how you would do it. Now, if you really wanted to, you could just do app install directory and then just do, you know, no subdirectory with dot save and all OSs. And then as long as you save it to your resources folder, not your user folder, then it will get synchronized up. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, outside of that, they also have root overrides and root overrides allow you to actually override paths. So if you, for instance, are saying on this specific platform, I want you to check for this. So for instance, if you're on Linux, you might want to replace the app install directory. Let's say you had WinApp local, right? And then you come over here and you can say, okay, but on Linux, that's Linux home, right? You will see that if I update this, it's going to say user profile app data local maps to the Linux home. 
if that makes sense. Now, this is probably a little bit more in depth than what we need, but basically it allows us to make sure that our saves are all cross-platform. So just make sure that you guys keep in mind that this exists and it's really useful and it's very nice to have. So you have so now you have two ways you can save your data. You can either do it manually or you could do it through this automatic save system. Now, at this point, we've covered pretty much the basics of how to integrate Steam. And unfortunately, we're at probably about an hour or so. So instead of extending this tutorial to be a two or three hour long tutorial, I've decided to cut a small cut here and just basically have this segment. So in this segment, we talked about how to log into Steam, how to get your friends, how to get some achievements, and how to actually set your achievements. We talked about how to create a leaderboard, and finally, we talked about how to save to cloud. Now, in the next video, we're going to talk about how to do multiplayer using the Steam backbone. And the nice thing about that is when you have multiplayer going through Steam's backbone, you don't have to do anything outside of setting up your um, code for it to work. And there's a lot of work behind it. And I'm definitely going to be showing you guys all of it. We're going to get into some really in-depth coding practices. And we're going to talk about inner pointers and byte arrays and stuff like that. So don't miss it. And that'll be in the next video, probably in the next few days. But that is all I have for you guys today. So if you like this video, hit that like button. Hey, if you dislike this video, go ahead and hit that dislike button because I am here to make content for you guys. This video, as with all of my videos, was a viewer suggested video. So if you have any suggestions, please leave them in the comments below and I'll be more than happy to put it on my list and get to it as soon as I can. And hey, if you guys have any questions or comments, leave them in the comments below or hit me up on my Discord. Link is in the description. I'll be more than happy to help you out with any issues you might be running into. The Steam integration is pretty weird, so there's a lot that can go wrong here, so I'm more than happy to help you guys out. But that is all I have for you guys today, so thank you so much again for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Thanks.